All right, so the title of this message, Begin Again, from Breshit, In the Beginning. That's what that means in English, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, uh, through chapter 6, verse 8. Just a little story uh, to start us off. I remember one time for me, uh, me and my brother were going to the movies with our dad. It was a lot of fun. He really liked arcade games. I was really big when he was growing up. Uh, for for me, uh, it's more like Xbox and like PlayStation and stuff like that. But it was like arcades back then, and and they would go and they would play games and stuff. So our dad was really good. And there was this one game at the movie theater um, that you could put a quarter in and you could play the little uh, the little yellow cheese thing that like eats all the ghosts, right? And uh, he was like, "Oh man, I'm gonna beat this high score." And uh, we were like, "Oh nice, like this is awesome to watch dad play." But sure enough, he beat it. <laughs> He beat, it was like something like 100,000 points or something like that. And he just kept going and going and going like, wow, he must have been pretty good in his day of video games. That was, that was pretty awesome. It was fun watching that. But, but if you lose, you, you get another life as long as you got a quarter. And that's a beautiful thing about arcade games, right? As long as you got a quarter. And it takes a lot of quarters sometimes to beat those games for sure. But it's like a new beginning. That's, that's, that's how that ties into tonight. It's a new, it's a new beginning. Somebody's got to pay for it. But thankfully, we didn't have to pay for our new beginning. Isn't that right? Amen. <laughs> right? That's a lot more than quarters, right? A lot more than quarters for that new beginning. But yes, sir. Uh, so just um, there's this kind of like multi-layered thing that I was designed to throw out there uh, to you all tonight. Um, just kind of seeing something in here. Um, just kind of bring a little extra depth uh, to reading this chapter that um, we've maybe heard many times. Starting in this verse right here, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. God blessed them, talking about Adam and Eve, like we heard during the Torah service, and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So, three uh, ideas that we can see all packed in this one verse. God blessed Adam and Eve with a blessing. He uh, told them to be fruitful and to multiply. Second thing. And the third thing is to rule, to have dominion, is, uh, is what we read depending on the translation. Um, and so a bit of an interesting question. Um, as we start off reading the Torah, we short uh, not long ago celebrated Rosh Hashanah, and uh, we come into the new year, and uh, this is the beginning of the Torah again. We finished up Deuteronomy, and every year we read the Torah every year. But as we get started this year, I, I thought it would be of use to us to ask the question, why the Torah? Why do we have it to begin with? What is the point of these five books that we read every year over and over that have been with the Jewish people for thousands of years? Um, and so the idea that we're looking at today is that um, we find the end or the goal in the beginning. From the beginning to the end, um, the theme or, or the goal is, is quite the same. The same and, and the goal of all of Scripture, the Old and the New Testament, for us, we find even in this first passage. And, uh, and so that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. And so uh, I just desire you to keep that in mind, this idea that God blessed them, Adam and Eve, when he first made them. He told them to be fruitful and to multiply, second thing. And the third thing was to rule or to have dominion. And so we find uh, an, interesting, uh, an interesting character here. And, and uh, I felt so encouraged. Doc was actually uh, talking with me about this exact same idea right before the service. And I felt really happy about that. It's like, oh, nice. Just like read my mind so to speak. But uh, it's a good thing, maybe, when it feels like we're on the same page with the Holy Spirit, right? Right? That's, that's ultimately. It's not mind reading. We're just listening to the same person. That's all it is, uh, hopefully. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, quite a bit after Adam, but he told him, go from your country, your family, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless them who bless you, and curse him who curses you. And in you all families of the earth will be blessed. 
So God spoke a blessing over Adam, but uh, sometime later, God spoke a blessing as well over Abraham. And it's very interesting to note that this is before Moses, and this is before the covenant made at Sinai. There was no Israel. There was no Jacob or Isaac. It was just him at the moment. And God shows up and tells him, I'm going to bless you uh, so that you will be a blessing, just like he did to Adam in the same picture. And so God's blessing over Adam and Eve, we could say, in the very beginning, before the fall, was a picture of God's blessing Israel through Abraham. And so it's very interesting that Adam and Eve had these three things communicated to them, had the blessing, had uh, this be fruitful and multiply, and had this rule. And when they sinned and they fell, they lost something. They lost their connection to God. They lost this communion with God, this connection to the life of God, and this uh, depravity, so to speak, that we hear people talk about entered into humanity, this death that really all it is is, um, and I feel like this helped me so much, that uh, death is the absence of life, just as darkness is the absence of light, or uh, evil is the absence of good. And, and that helped me so much because I remember someone saying, well, if God is so good, why did, why did he create evil? And I felt like that helps me to understand, you know, evil isn't something that's created as much as it is the absence of something. So it's like God's existence necessitates what comes when he is not present, if that makes any sense. And I feel like that's so powerful because uh, it's surprising uh, the number of youth that actually ask that question. Like, oh, if God was so smart, why did he make Lucifer? You can just save us all a bunch of problems by just not creating him, right? Um, right. But ultimately, uh, for me, the difference between us and the angels was we can be redeemed. But uh, in order for love to exist, there has to be the possibility of rejection or else it's not real love. It's just slavery, right? That's powerful. That's powerful. I feel like it helps so much talking to talking to youth, especially. Man, you got some good questions. Good questions. Galatians chapter three, verse thirteen to fourteen. So we find Paul talking with Galatians from Galatia, and he says, "Messiah Yeshua liberated us from the Torah's curse, that is death, that comes from breaking the law, having become a curse for us." For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that through Messiah Yeshua, and what do we see here? The blessing of Abraham might come not just to the Jews, not just to Israel, but to the Gentiles. So that we might receive the promise of the Ruach through trusting faith. Through trusting faith. And so there was something that was, so that was lost by Adam, this blessing. Um, when he chose to subject himself to the enemy, uh, the God of this world uh, was not the God of this world before Adam gave him the keys, so to speak, uh, because God gave them to Adam when he gave him that dominion. But God is going to get it back. And God plants a seed in Abraham. But it's not just for the Jewish people. Ultimately, it's for all of the world, for all of the world to come back to relationship with him and to have the blessing. But ultimately, what is, what is this blessing? That we might receive the promise of the Ruach through trusting faith. I really do feel like we read the scripture and this blessing ultimately is the life of God. The life of God that gives birth to good works. That gives birth to everything that we see in the creation story. and That gives birth to, to the earth. That gives birth to plants. And to, to the birds, to the animals, it's the life of God where all of that finds its origin. And that blessing, the life of God, is, is I, I really do feel like the ultimate goal that God was getting back to humanity, beginning with Adam and concluding with Messiah, starting all the way back with Adam. With Adam. And so we continue on to see this, uh, this kind of similarity between Adam and and Abraham, Adam before the fall, and Abraham after the fall. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I am childless, and the heir of my house 
is Eliezer of Damascus. Abram said, since you have not given me any children, my heir is a servant born in my house. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this man will not be your heir, but a son that is from your own body will be your heir. He brought him outside and said, look up toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, so will your descendants be like the stars, like the stars. I remember growing up in uh, San Antonio, we didn't really see the stars very much because there was so much light. We would just see the moon and street lights. <laughs> And that was pretty much it. And it was just orange, like, up in the sky. But then I went over to Claudia's house, and Claudia lives way out in the country. And it was so awesome because the sun would go down, and I would be out there with her and her family. And you would see all these stars that were, that were there, that were just that were up there. And, and for me, I just thought about, like, man, what Abraham may have seen in the desert where there were no street lights, there were no cars, there was no city lights. There was none of that. It was just the pure sky, just seeing all of that. And to imagine God telling him with no child, Try and count them if you can. Try and count them. Impossible. <laughs> Impossible. Especially their shooting stars. It's like you get distracted, you lose count, and then it's like, oh, man, got to start all over again from one. I made it to 50 million, and now I got to start all over again. I'm going to sleep, right? I'm going to sleep. But this is so powerful. This is so powerful that when God spoke to Adam and said, be fruitful and multiply, we find a second similarity between the life of Adam before the fall and Abraham after the fall. This is a picture of the established nation of Israel that's promised to Abraham by God, that your descendants will be as numerous as the stars of the sky, even as he told Adam, be fruitful and multiply. And we see this even in the New Covenant. In the New Covenant with Yeshua. Yeshua, Matthew 28, 8 through 2, 18 through 20. And Yeshua came up to them and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is after the resurrection. So go, therefore, and make disciples of, uh, of how many nations? Of all nations, right? That's so different. That's so different than go and annihilate the heathen and kill them all until they are all dead, right? All nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Ruach HaKodesh, or Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. So there are still commands. There is still the voice of God, right? It's not gone forever just because Yeshua came. Ultimately, we are to be united with God, and His character is beautiful, and He still speaks. He still speaks through his word. Amen. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I feel like a lot of these verses are very familiar maybe to some of us, but the point tonight is just to, to draw this similarity of idea that's in three separate places in the Bible from the beginning, almost this middle with the people of Israel all the way through the end with Yeshua, that there was this idea of multiplying of being blessed, but also multiplying, that God told Adam to multiply and then the fall, but God brought it right back telling Abraham, I will multiply you and make you as numerous as the stars of the sky. And even through then, the people of Israel, that God then through Yeshua says, go make disciples, not just of the Jewish people, but of all the world of all nations, again, bringing the blessing, the life of God to all humanity, but but through increase, through multiplication. It's, it's such a beautiful thing, such a beautiful thing. Beauty in simplicity, maybe, um, that really just ties the Bible together, that ties the Bible together. And so Genesis 13, as we look at this last little similarity here, after Lot had departed from him, the Lord said to Abram, lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward uh, and southward and eastward and westward all the land that you see i will give to you and to your descendants forever and we know this is the land of canaan or the promised land later i will make your descendants like the dust of the earth so that if a man could number the dust of the earth then your descendants could also be numbered arise and walk throughout the land across its length and its width for i will give it to you for I will give it to you. And so this idea of the, the, the promised land, I really do feel like this is a, a similar picture of have dominion that was spoken 
to Adam, this idea of not just numeric increase, but also of a kingdom, the idea of a kingdom, the idea of land that is owned, uh, a space, if you will, that the presence of God inhabits. And so this have dominion was a picture of the promised land as described to Abraham by God himself. And we see even again, John 18, 35 through 36, Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and ruling Kohanim or, or ruling priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Pilate asked him. We read about Pilate and, and he really just seemed like someone who didn't want to be bothered. <laughs> He didn't really care about Yeshua one way or the other. It's just like, man, leave me alone, man. I don't want any problems. I don't know what you did, but they don't like you. So what do you, like? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Just, I, I, I just want to go back home or whatever, eat some grapes. Yeshua answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I wouldn't be handed over to the Judean leaders. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And I feel like this is very powerful. Because uh, this right here is a, um, what I've understood is it's a reason why many Jews today don't embrace Yeshua as Messiah. Uh, because they, they feel like, you know, he lost. He, he, they killed him. They killed him. Our Messiah is supposed to be a king that comes in and slaughters all the people and just chops everyone's heads off that doesn't believe in him, and he just rules. And Yeshua failed miserably. He let them kill him. <laughs> he didn't even fight. Right? But that comes from an idea that the kingdom of this earth was all there is to it. But that's not what we hear from Yeshua himself. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not just land. And, and we hear even... Uh, Yeshua, this talk throughout Scripture of store up from your, for yourselves treasures where? In heaven. Not just on earth where the moth and the rust can corrupt and people can break in and steal. This is all temporary. This is all temporary. It's all fading away. And we hear Paul talk about the same thing, that this is all temporary. It's not going to be here forever. And we hear John in the book of Revelation affirm the same thing. Thing where we read about the new heaven and the new earth. That this is here for a time, but it is not everything that there is to enjoy. To enjoy. I feel like I'm like moving a little too fast <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> oh man. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse one. For we know that if the tent our earthly home is torn down. We have a building from God, a home not made with human hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. If indeed after we have put it on, we will not be found naked. Reading this, just thinking about the things we've talked about, I feel like perhaps this is a reference to Adam. That we won't be found naked the way that he was found by God, naked. Without that glory, without that connection to God, without that life of God flowing through him. But Paul's talking about this tent, our earthly home. I feel like that's, that's this, this body. If it's torn down, we have a building uh, from God. Something that lasts forever that's not made with human hands, it's eternal in heaven. And we groan for it, longing to be clothed, that we would not be found naked when God comes. For we groan while we are in this tent, burdened because we don't want to be unclothed, but to be clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. This blessing, right? Now the one who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Ruach as a pledge. And I feel like this purpose started with Adam. And after the fall, it was revived, so to speak, in Abraham, that this promise came again, that even before the Torah was given, that there was a promise of life, that it's not going to be because of your effort. It's going to be because I came to you and you took a hold of me 
that I knocked on the door to your heart and you opened your heart to me to let me in. Not just to rule a kingdom, but to rule in our hearts, in our hearts. And I, and I feel like that's so much more powerful. Coming back to that idea of, of love that we talked about for just a bit. It's one thing for a king to rule the kingdom and to behead all of his enemies, right? A king doesn't have to be loved if he is feared. A lot of times fear is seen as a much more powerful weapon of subjection than love. Because no one would dare rise against a leader that they're terrified of, right? But is that what God wants in Scripture? Is that what he wants? Uh, a nation full of people that are terrified of him and that run from him as Adam did when he was without uh, this confidence, without this connection. It's not what God wants. And I feel like that's so powerful because uh, I really feel like the importance and application in that is that the message of the gospel is not spread by the sword. And that's and that's and that's not uh, what what some others would say <laughs> about their uh, religion. Right. And that's that's a very big contrast. That's a very big contrast that by the grace of God, we can stand confident and peaceful in the face of death because it means nothing to the eternal life that God has given us, right? Right, and that's so powerful, and I feel like there's maybe coming a day very soon when that kind of message is going to be very important because when people threaten our jobs or they threaten our livelihoods or they threaten our family or they threaten us in any way that they can to say, you know, you Yeshua followers are such a problem, you know? Why won't you just bow? Why won't you just bow in the days of Paul? Why won't you just burn a little incense to the gods, right? It's just a little incense. It's just a little incense, a little potpourri, right? But it's not just potpourri. It's not just potpourri. It's allegiance in the heart, in the heart. And I feel like that's what God really wants. That's what he's after from the inside out, something that will last and that will endure when there is a, a nation of people that love their king feel like they can endure pain for that king. They can endure sacrifice. They're willing to serve that king and to go with him into battle, to sacrifice of, of what they have for the sake of the kingdom. And I feel like that's a much happier kingdom. And I really do feel like practically that is a kingdom that ultimately is much more powerful, much more powerful, right? Amen. It's so awesome. So awesome. Therefore, we are always confident and know that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We aren't bound by what we see. We look towards something greater, something more magnificent, something that will last for much longer. We are confident, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether at home or absent, whether living or dead, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him. Right? And there's a really interesting end to this little passage. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Messiah so that each one may receive what is due for the things he did while in the body, whether good or bad. Accountability. Accountability. And I, and I feel like, again, following Yeshua is so beautiful. To my knowledge, those that serve God without Yeshua, uh, for a while we were uh, having some problems before we came here with this idea of Judaism and wrestling through a lot of the objections that they have to Christianity uh, and Messianic Judaism, Yeshua in general. And I feel like one of the things that really helped me as a stronghold in working through all that, because it can look very tight. <laughs> it can look very tight, that's for sure. Uh, you, you, you very quickly get this idea <laughs> that they're, they do not like people who believe in Yeshua. Their intention is not to give Yeshua followers anything <laughs> in, in conversation at all. Uh, like, it, you talk about bias, man. Like, it, it, is not, it is not a level playing field. I can tell you that right now. That's what I've understood. And one of the things that's helped me so much is this idea that without Yeshua, we stand before God. And I looked for confidence. For confidence. How do you know that what you're doing is going to be good enough? 
and there was none really to be found. They don't, they don't know. They don't know. Serving without Yeshua. Well, you know, I'm going to do my best. Well, is that going to be good enough? <laughs> I don't know. I hope so. But I don't want to hope so. <laughs> That's terrible. I don't want to go to sleep hoping so every night. Not when there's a hope <laughs> available over here, right? And the same thing for those that serve Allah, if I could say, same thing. And, and don't take my word for it. It's not necessarily a criticism. You can go read it for yourself. Where's the confidence? What I've understood is, is, you know, if Allah's having a good day, you get into heaven. If he's having a bad day, well, that's too bad, right? That's too bad for you. <laughs> too bad for you. But I don't, that doesn't help me feel better going to sleep at night. <laughs> that he may be having a bad day, woke up on the wrong side of the bed, and I end up burning in hell for all eternity. And I don't even know why. <laughs> I don't even know why. But thankfully, that's not how it is with Yeshua. And, and for me, that's such a powerful thing. If, if nothing else, that Yeshua says, I'm putting my life on the line, that when you stand before God, you will have something to have confidence in. And we hear that word confidence mentioned so much throughout the Brit Hadashah. Confidence before God, coming boldly before the throne of grace. Where else do we find that? I really feel like nowhere. Nowhere. Because it's not in ourselves. The high priest didn't come in his own name before the mercy seat. It was through the blood. And we come through the blood of Messiah. And that's so powerful because God himself paid the price, right? That's so awesome and it's so unique. The blood of Yeshua. The blood of Yeshua. We can hear so much about religion and so much about one world religion and so much about coexist. But you bring up the blood of Messiah and it's like the conversation goes quiet so fast. Right? The blood of Messiah. Not just Messiah or Yeshua, the teacher, the prophet. No, the blood. The blood that was poured out and shed. The death that was died. For my sake, for the sake of the world. To atone for me. And so unique. So unique to the God that we serve. That He would give His own life for us, for our sake. For the, for the sake of this, for the sake of this, to begin again, what Adam lost, the seed was planted in Abraham that would be fulfilled so many, many, many years later in Yeshua. And I feel like that's the point of the Torah. That's the point of the Scripture, is to take us from this beginning to the end in the heart of God, how God was with man, God was with humanity, and humanity fell, and then God redeems him. And it's so simple maybe, but so powerful because it took so long, and God was so patient. God was so patient to imagine what God may have felt when Assyria was coming in and conquering, and Babylon was coming in and conquering the people of God because they had turned away from him. How hopeless that may have looked. When Elijah was crying out, feeling like the only prophet, how hopeless it may have looked when the prophets were being killed for prophesying the word of the Lord against the people that didn't want to hear it. How hopeless it may have looked, but God never gave up. He never gave up. He had such confidence in this seed. To imagine waiting for something for 4,000 years, that's hardly even fathomable. <laughs> For, for me, waiting for popcorn, right? It's long enough. We, we've heard that, right? They, they've said that about my generation, right? The popcorn generation. You just want everything fast because you got your phone. You can just look up something fast. You make food fast. You got fast food, right? You got social media. You don't have to send a letter anymore. There's no such thing really as like pen pals as much anymore, right? Because you can blast your whole life story to like a bajillion people in like five seconds. <laughs> and it's so awesome, but to imagine the contrast, to imagine the contrast, it's hard enough imagining the people that blazed through the frontier, right? There was no iPad to give the kids in the back of the little station wagon, right? With the cows going through, hoping you didn't get ambushed by someone and end up dead. That was patience. That was a lot of patience. But 4,000 years, that's a long time. That's a long time 
seeing civilization after civilization and never giving up on humanity, that I know that my son is coming. I know he's coming. I can see it in Adam. I can see it in Noah. I can see it in Abraham. I can see it in the prophets. And finally he saw it. And how hopeless it looked when he was killed, when he was dead. And how the kingdom of darkness perhaps rejoiced. That we read in Scripture that had they known what was happening, they'd have never crucified the Lord of glory. (laughs) But he did it for us. He did it for us. This blessing for life, increase everlasting in the promised land in the presence of of God for each one of us and yet all of us at the same time, corporate yet individual. This life that is everlasting, that is always increasing with God in His presence, in His presence from the very beginning, that we would have it back, but because we want it, not because we are forced into it. To have a people that worship Him, that we read about in Revelation, giving Him glory because they chose Him. And they were not going to fall away. They were not going to bow even in the face of death itself. That I love my king so much that what does my life mean to me for the sake of having Yeshua? Right? And that that love would permeate us every moment, even here on the earth. And so just as we close, just something to think about for the week. What is our new beginning? This is a new year, just like we celebrate January 1, January 1st. But just to think about it, a new leaf to turn over, so to speak. But if nothing else, just dwelling on this idea that I'm excited for the life of Yeshua that has already been poured into me. And I'm going to live in that awareness that this is not all there is. That there's coming a beautiful day when I'm going to see him face to face and through his blood. I don't have to be ashamed, right? I don't have to run like Adam did. I can run to him and I can embrace him and I'll be with him forever and we'll never have to be apart again. Isn't that right? How powerful that is. Beautiful. Amen. We invite you to bow your heads as we finish. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for everything that you have given. Lord, everything that you have sacrificed and the patience, Lord, that you have with us. Lord, the mercy and the grace Lord, that you have with us to lead us as a gentle shepherd, Lord, teaching us. We choose to follow you, Lord, in this moment, even afresh from our heart. Lord, not because we have to, not because we're forced to, Lord, but we love you. We love you and and we want to follow you. We choose to follow you. That, Lord, like the, like the song says that we hear, Lord, though none go with me, still I will follow. Lord, and even if we walk alone, Lord, that you are enough of a companion for us every day. And we thank you for it. But we thank you that we don't have to walk alone in this body of believers, Lord, that we can walk together, encouraging one another every day that there is a hope that we don't give up, that we grow, that we pour into each other and encourage each other, Lord, in this hope and this excitement that we have in our hearts that we'll see you face to face one day. And we thank you and we give you glory, Lord. We thank you for everything you're doing in our lives. And it's in Yeshua's name we thank you and we pray. Amen.